All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, presentation on testing and certification of intermessent coating to AS4100 as required by NCC. As I said before, my name is Megan Purdy, and on behalf of Engineers Australia, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Firstly, in keeping with our... Oops. Go to acknowledgement of country. First, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Now, before we get started tonight, I would like to acknowledge that tonight's event um, is not possible without the valuable support of our industry partner, Dulux Protective Coatings. Dulux Group is a manufacturer and marketer of products that protect, maintain and enhance the spaces and places in which we live and work. From household rooms transformed by the latest designer colours, to the industrial coatings that protect landmark infrastructures such as bridges and the construction solutions that reinforce them. Gelux products are at work. Their brands have been woven into the fabric of the communities where they operate, helping consumers to live better and more comfortable lives. Now, Gelux have also been very kind enough to run a door prize for tonight with a drone up for grabs. So I hope everyone here has completed their entry. If not, uh, please do so before the end of the night and we'll, um, we will draw that before we end tonight. Now, we will be hearing from three speakers and then we will follow by our Q&A. Um, so I would encourage you just to hold on to your questions till we get to that final Q&A segment. I would now like to welcome our first speaker for tonight, Dr. Christian Maluk. Uh, Dr. Maluk is a technical Technical Director at Astute Fire and his research and teaching activities are centred in fire safety engineering, structural engineering, timber engineering and varied topics related to materials science. Christian's research outcomes in fire safety science and engineering have received internationally acclaimed attention, embodied by novel methods used for better understanding the behaviour of materials and structures in the event of a fire. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Maluk. The title of my presentation today is Thin Intimation Coatings, uh, focusing on a study to understand where, where we understand when things might not work as expected. Uh, I know the title of, of the thesis might not, of, of, the, of the presentation might not be very clear at the moment, uh, but I hope that by the end of the presentation, it becomes clear to, to everyone listening and, and those of you in the room. I thought to introduce uh, this series and, and because of the context of the of the two other speakers presenting, I devoted these two slides to, to uh, essentially understanding the context of structural fire engineering in the fire safety strategy and how we uh, deliver safety in a, in a, in a, in a building. Uh, and this is of course generic to, to the fire safety engineering industry. Uh, <clears throat> so in the event of a fire and when a fire starts, the uh, detection is uh, what kicks off the alarm system, which essentially triggers the evacuation of, of occupants in the building. Uh, and it's only then where displacement of occupants away from where the fire originates uh, takes place. Uh, and without going into much detail uh, of uh, different strategies and how we get people out of the building, uh, uh, it's uh, it's important to highlight that for a building of, of, of this nature, for example, uh, which is the Brisbane Sky Tower, uh, the the complexity of the building and the scale of the building requires for relatively complex crowd management, which uh, most times ends up with asking people to wait, uh, and that's what we call refugee areas. Uh, uh, of course, combined with that, we have the element of automatic fire suppression, which is essentially sprinklers, which uh, might or might not uh, both control and uh, to a certain extent distinguish uh, uh, 
uh, a chronic fire. Uh, and also we have the element of compartmentation, which essentially is, uh, it, it provides a, an element that slows the uh, growth of the fire, but also the spread of the smoke away from the area where the fire originates. Uh, at, as all this is taking place, fire service intervention is uh, also a, a key element in, first, in the fire service strategy with the operation taking place uh, external or internal to the, to the building. Uh, again, uh, as you might uh, expect, based on the complexity, scale, and size of the building. Uh, and it's only the uh, uh, structure itself and the ability of that uh, structure to, to, to remain in place uh, that allows for everything else to take place. Yeah. We essentially, we lose the structure, we lose the building, and none of what's above really matters. Okay, And I hope that gives a bit of context on how important structural fire engineering is and, and, and delivering fire safe structure is. Uh, the other slide that I wanted to share before we get going is uh, this one, which uh, is, a, is a phrase that I've kind of been uh, uh, using for quite some time now, where, where and, and it's something that the more I, the more I progress in, in this industry, the more it makes sense to me. Uh, which is to do with the fact that uh, although fires are, uh, sorry, uh, structures failing uh, in the event of a fire, it's not a very common event. When it does happen, it's uh, almost always for reasons that we would not have expected uh, or predicted on the basis of, of the structure finding design or analysis done for that structure. Okay, and that's something which is very important to keep in mind. Uh, now, going into thing to mentioned coatings, uh, the two other speakers presenting after me will be able to articulate much better than me what thing to mentioned coatings are and how we use them. But I thought it would just be important to highlight that uh, there are a fire safety solution which has a, a relative ease of application. It can be used both on site or off site. Uh, and it's essentially a solution that provides little or no constraint to the architectural vision uh, of what otherwise would be a, a, an unprotected steel structure. So most times uh, it's at the very end of the presentation that we acknowledge uh, the people who actually did the work. Uh, I thought I'd put them now uh, a bit earlier in the presentation. Uh, and these are students that uh, have uh, at some point over the past seven years of study at the University of Vincent. Uh, it's only Stavros, I think, yeah, Stavros and, and Ivan who are still completing their studies at, at the University of Queensland. Uh, and it's, it's their work which I'm, I'm about to present. Uh, and this, uh, this research team, which has uh, evolved in time, has, has been a uh, uh, based on a mission, uh, and, and the mission has been to learn from failure, and I know that might sound uh, a bit odd, uh, but it's uh, essentially not to only focus on the several instances for which intumescent coatings might work very well, but instead investigate uh, the fire scenarios and design conditions and applications for which we, uh, uh, we think uh, things might not work as, as expected. Uh, so I'm going to go over uh, uh, a few key research outcomes that, that we've uh, obtained uh, out of, out of uh, several years of, of studies on this topic. So we, before we get going, I thought it was important to highlight that most of the work that I'm about to present is experimental work uh, and that the work is based on, on a testing testing device called Atris, where we essentially are able to control the heating conditions in a relatively precise way, uh, repeat tests with, with high confidence on, on the repeatability of the, of the conditions that we're uh, imposing, but also instrument uh, test samples in a way 
uh, which is uh, which allows us to observe and measure things in a in a, in a very good way. And, and I'll explain a bit more what what I mean with that later on. Uh, one of the very first studies of, that we took on was to uh, understand the critical heat flux for onset of sweating. Uh, and although this is not a very common thing to do with with intumescent encodings, it's a very common thing to do with other uh, phenomena in, in fire safety science, uh, as for example, ignition, uh, where we uh, always try to understand what the critical heat flux of ignition of materials is. Okay, so this concept is very similar, and it essentially uh, allowed us to understand that there's a threshold, a very well-defined threshold for which a critical, uh, sorry, for which swelling will not occur. Uh, and if we, it's only when we uh, impose heating conditions which are above that threshold is that uh, the full uh, appropriate swelling of the intumescent takes place. The, these slides shows a experimental work which was devoted to understanding the sensitivity of both swelling and heating uh, of the of the intumescent coating for a range of, of fire scenarios. In, in this example, we went from 10 kilowatt per meter square to 90 kilowatt per meter square. Uh, and and, and we, we did this for what I'm showing here is only for one DFT, but we did this for different uh, DFTs. Uh, but what's interesting from the data is that the the technique that was developed by, by Andrea Lugrini uh, allowed him to uh, measure the in-depth temperature of the swelling uh, intumescent uh, as it was uh, growing and swelling uh, uh, and, and obtain very good quality data, very repeatable data. What you're showing here, what, what I'm showing here is, is several tests done on identical samples. Uh, so he was able to both measure the rate of swelling and also the temperature of swelling inside the inside the paints. Uh, another work, and this is uh, a bit earlier in, in my career, this is work that was done at, at the University of Edinburgh, uh, compared the sensitivity of, of the behavior of, of, of an intumescent product to a standard curve as compared to a smoldering curve. Uh, and in this one, we found that uh, for the smoldering curve, which for those of you that don't know, it's a slow growing uh, heating condition or fire scenario where then at some point it picks up. We found that the intumescent was very ineffective and it, it even delaminated and, and, and fall off uh, when, when exposed. Uh, all this data that we've been collected on both swelling and also internal heating conditions of, of paint allow us to pr produce an explicit model uh, for both the swelling and the heating conditions of paint. Uh, and this is essentially a, a finite difference heat transfer model, heat conduction model, where it has the added complexity of adding nodes as swelling of the paint takes place. Uh, and you can see here on this, on this plot, how good we became at uh, predicting what the internal temperature of pain would be uh, in the event of a fire for different heating conditions for different DFTs. Another piece of work that we did was uh, on understanding how the thermal conditions, not at the front, at the heated side of the sample, but behind the sample and behind the structural element, can uh, govern to a certain extent how swelling will take place. Okay, and for this purpose, uh, we built a, a water cool system which was able to uh, control uh, the heating condition at the back of the sample, acting as a heat sink. Uh, and as you can see here, and, uh, and this work was. Uh, uh, was done again within the scope of Andrea Rubinini's studies, uh, we were able to quite clearly demonstrate that 
when the conditions behind the samples were adiabatic, the swelling is the one that you see on the red line. Uh, and as we turn on the, uh, the, the heat sink capacity of the, of the sample holder, we saw uh, a, a a change in how the paint swell uh, and essentially how the whole system performed. Uh, this is another interesting one here. Uh, Diana Bejarano, she uh, essentially evaluate the impact of hindering uh, or blocking the free swelling of the paint. Uh, and this is, this is not a very easy uh, experimental test to run because of, of the several things taking place. She was able to demonstrate that uh, when paint is prevented from swelling, there was an increase of temperature uh, of the substrate of the steel sample, uh, which as you can see from this plot, it could get up to 150 degrees when compared to that paint uh, without the, the the hindering of the, the block of the, of the swelling. <clears throat> uh, in, in recent years, we've started exploring uh, what happens with other building construct, uh, construction materials and, and uh, people in the vast have used the uh, intumescents uh, in, in concrete elements as well, and also in, in timber materials, but we realized that there was not an abundant amount of, of, of data and research in this space. Uh, and, and essentially, the work that we did uh, looked at how uh, intumescents uh, could perform for, for timber. The other thing that we did was compare how uh, paint could be used to provide an equivalent level of, of, of protection uh, to that uh, obtained by using plasterboard. And here you can see Again, using the same equipment, the behavior of a sample uh, protected using fire rated plasterboard as compared to, to the anatomic code. Again, for a timber sample. Uh, that work uh, that was done by, by Rossi Hart uh, essentially allows us to systematically test for two heating conditions, 50 and 100 kilowatt per square. Uh, the, the internal temperature of the timber, which is for, for, for timber design far very important, uh, compare how as we increase uh, the number of of, uh, of plasterboards and the amount of paint, how the uh, the internal temperature of timber changes. Uh, I think the two, the, the images on the slides are, are incorrect, but the, the previous slide had to do with, with the data on plasterboard, and this slide has to do with, with temperature data for different coatings. Uh, and we went from, from uh, one millimeter DFT up to two millimeters DFT, and you can see how we shift the temperature increase. But the comparison between timber and plasterboard allows us to produce this plot that you see here, which is essentially a formulation for uh, understanding the amount of intumescent that we need to deliver the same protection as that given by, by plasterboards, uh, one, two, or three layers of plasterboards, uh, which, which we thought was, was uh, very interesting and, and useful for, for an industry which today uh, has very few options when it comes to protecting uh, mass timber structures. And now to wrap up the presentation, uh, I thought I'd go over uh, things that we've concluded out of the work that we've uh, performed over the years. Uh, and there's a few things that, that we today know uh, with relatively high certainty. One of them being, uh, as you would expect, that the higher DFT results in higher total swelling and therefore better insulation of the substrate. Uh, that the physical swelling is govern, uh, governs the performance of, of things to mention coatings. And this is something that we, we, we demonstrate like 
quite clear with the work, uh, more than the physical properties and conditions of the of the swell paint, having low density, uh, low thermal conductivity, uh, is the actual physical swelling of the paint which dominates and governs uh, how good that paint will be at uh, insulating the, the substrate. Uh, we, we demonstrate that we could build an explicit model for the purpose of uh, predicting the internal temperature of swelling coating for different DFTs for different heating conditions. And this is, again, a validated uh, model, uh, which, of course, now with, with that tool in hand, we can now use it for the purpose of a, a better uh, understanding the type of paints and a amount that we need in different applications under different heating conditions. Uh, we understood that the thermal uh, conditions of the substrate uh, can influence the swelling behavior. And this is something that, that of course, we knew beforehand. And, and if, if you've ever witnessed uh, 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 the test of, of a steel sample in a furnace, they usually apply insulation at the back to make sure that those conditions are adiabatic. But it was very important to uh, quantify the degree to which those conditions at the back affect how the paint will perform and, and behave. Uh, we, we found that the, hin uh, the hindered free swelling can influence the, the temperature of the protected substrate significantly. Uh, and uh, that thin to mesen coatings can work in, in delaying the onset of charring of timber, uh, which was our work on, on, on mass timber. Now, there's a few things that we to date do not know. Okay. And I thought I, I go over those as well. Uh, we're yet, and this is kind of global to, to how we take the approach, we yet don't have a quantifiable yet practical prediction for the thresholds in which swelling of intumescent will not be effective. And this has to do with the fire scenario, the type of coating, the amount of paint described by the DFT, the substrate type and the thermal conditions of that substrate or material or structure, uh, and the quantifiable uh, uh, effects of the hindered free swelling, uh, which is the blockage of the paint from, from or preventing the paint from, from swelling uh, as it should. Uh, so we, we're, we're still in a mission to obtain quantifiable values which apply for, for a range of, of, of again, far scenarios, type of coatings, DFTs, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and when it comes to, to timber structures, which is something that in recent years, we've invested a lot of, of time in, in, in researching. Uh, we have a, a, a whole new uh, experimental campaign that uh, that will start in the next few months and will go over for for the next couple of years, which has to do not only with understanding how intumescent coatings can be used for the purpose of uh, delaying the temperature increase internally for the timber, but also how these products can be used in different amounts for the purpose of, of changing the overall ignition and burning behavior of timber. Essentially, the conditions at which timber will uh, ignite, the conditions at which the fire on those surfaces will spread, or the flames on, on, on the timber surface will spread, uh, the conditions that then go into, into how that timber releases uh, energy into a, into a fire compartment, uh, and then essentially how the timber charge. Uh, and, and that's the work that, that the PhD student Stavros uh, is uh, essentially, uh, that's, that's work that, that he's taking. Uh, so <laughs> if you have any questions, I, I advise that, that, that you contact Stavros directly. So, uh, and that, that's what he'll be completing for the next years. So
So this is uh, the end of my presentation. I thought before leaving, I, I thought I would remind ourselves that there are two options to to go and, and two, two roadmaps, essentially. Uh, and we, it's good that we understand the consequences of, of not changing anything and just continue to perform research and development, only looking at the conditions where paint can work uh, appropriately. Uh, and is that we will continue in, in, in research and development roadmaps, which are based on, on understanding uh, into machine codings under one or maybe a handful of fire scenario, scenarios and conditions, which might not reflect the full family of applications, fire scenarios, conditions that we might have in the built environment. Uh, we also, as a consequence of this, will never investigate situations and applications for which a specific intumescent will not be or could not be appropriate. Uh, and always be at risk of uh, a concept that is, 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 is used uh, very often in during the, uh, the uh, be a subject of, of innovation blind spots, uh, resulting in, in unperceived challenges uh, and risks on how we design fire safe structures. Uh, but the future is bright, I think, uh, and uh, by by shifting how we do certain things, we can have manufacturers, engineers, uh, and research communities uh, aiming to understand and truly understand the nature of the products, not only when they behave well, but also when they behave not so well uh, and report on those. Uh, and, and in that environment, being able to manage uh, the consequences of failure as well. Uh, and not only focus on, on justifying a low probability of failure, uh, understanding that failure is uh, possible, uh, and therefore understanding how uh, the structure will, will respond to that failure. So that's mainly me. Uh, thank you very much for those listening and those in the room. Uh, my name is there. Uh, if you want, if you have any questions. Uh, thanks to Engineers Australia for, for inviting me to deliver this presentation and uh, happy to respond uh, to any questions during the Q&A later. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we look forward to uh, you joining us with the Q&A. I would now like to welcome our second speaker, Suki Sandana Yake. Suki is a fire assessment engineer with Warrington Fire Australia, based here in Brisbane. With an extensive knowledge of Australian fire testing and assessment standards, she provides fire assessments for passive fire protection of structural components and systems, demonstrating compliance with the performance requirements of the National Construction Code. Specialising in fire protection of structural steel, she has worked with numerous Australian and international clients delivering both product and project specific fire assessment reports and consultancy advice relating to passive fire protection. Please join me in welcoming Suki. All right, th thank you very much, Meg. Um, Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Suki Sendanaika and I'm a fire assessment engineer with Warrington Fire Australia. At Warrington Fire, we specialize in fire safety engineering, testing, assessments and certification. Our testing lab is in Melbourne, but our engineers are spread across the country. Um, I myself am based in Brisbane and I have worked with and continue to work with both local and international clients helping them demonstrate uh, compliance of their fire protection products in accordance with the minimum requirements of the National Construction Code of Australia. So today I would like to discuss how intermessent products can be, uh, uh, intermessent products used for the fire protection of steel components can meet this established compliance criteria in order to be marketed in Australia. So the National Construction Code or the NCC is made up of three volumes. So today I will be focusing on volume one and two, which set out minimum fire performance requirements 
that are needed to ensure fire safety in buildings. So one such performance requirement is CP1. Now, CP1 states that a building element must maintain structural stability for a given period of time so as to not compromise the overall structural stability for that given period of time. So this performance requirement can be either met through a performance solution or through deemed to satisfy provisions given in the NCC. So in this pre uh, presentation, I'll be talking about the compliance pathway through DTS provisions. So DTS provisions in the NCC define the minimum fire resistance performance expected from a building element in order to meet that overall performance requirement of structural stability. So for example, an external load-bearing wall, which is very close to the fire source, and in a type A construction and a class 5 building, class 5 being an office building, it needs to have a minimum fire resistance level, or FRL, of 120, 120, 120. For an external load-bearing column, it's 120 dash dash. And this table goes on. So what's this fire resistance performance? Fire resistance can be quantified as the time for which an element can meet certain criteria during exposure to a standard fire test. Fire resistance level, or FRL, is a term used in Australia, and it's used to describe the fire performance of a building element in terms of three criteria, structural adequacy, integrity, and insulation. An important note here is that fire resistance level can only be assigned to a building element that has been subjected to a standard fire test. In Australia, the standard fire test method is given in AS 1530 Part 4. AS uh, 1530 Part 4 um, actually has a test methodology for a range of building elements, including beams and columns. So this equation given here is the standard fire curve used in furnace tests, and it's equal to the ISO 834 cellular 6 standard fire curve. For structural elements like beams and columns, it's only structural adequacy criteria that is required by the NCC. For example, in those minimum FRL tables that we were looking at, for the external load-bearing column, it was only 120 that was required in terms of structural adequacy. The other uh, criteria were left blank, so it was 120 dash dash. So structural adequacy um, is the time taken for a structural member to collapse under a given load, or it's, in other words, it's the time taken for a load-bearing component to no longer be able to maintain stability or to sustain an applied load, and their deflections and axial contractions exceed defined limits in AS1530 Par 4, which we will see in a bit later. So when only structural adequacy is concerned, the FRL is written out as, uh, for example, as 120 dash dash. Specifically for steel beams and columns, we have to look at AS 4100, which is the Australian standard for steel structures. And in AS 4100, they talk about a term called PSA, period of structural adequacy. And it's actually related to the structural adequacy criteria in the FRL. So PSA is the time for a steel member to reach the limit state of structural adequacy when a building element is subjected to a standard fire test. So an unprotected steel member generally undergoes a significant loss of strength and stiffness after around 300 degrees. So these equations from, are from AS4100, and they can be used to define the relationship between steel temperature and the yield strength and um, modulus of elasticity in steel. So for example, at around 550 degrees of steel temperature, the yield strength is approximately about 50% of the ambient yield strength. And this affects the maximum load that the member can carry at any given time. So this steel temperature that affects these material properties depend on the cross-sectional area of the steel member and how many sides of it is exposed. So the section factor is the ratio between the heated or the exposed perimeter to the cross-sectional area. So it could be a four-sided exposure condition where it's exposed on all four sides. It could have uh, a slab abutting on the top, which is a three-sided exposure, and it goes on. AS4100 also gives us these equations, which can be used to find or calculate the time at which a certain steel temperature is reached. For example, a steel column with a section factor of 165 
will reach a critical temperature of 550 degrees at around 18 minutes with three-sided exposure and 15 minutes with four-sided fire exposure. Now, 550 degrees is just an example that I've used. Uh, critical temperatures will vary depending on the project and the applied load. And they're also defined as limiting temperatures. So a limiting temperature is the design maximum temperature that a steel member can be allowed to reach before it collapses and or it fails under a given load. So 18 and 15 minutes is quite low, and it's not in line with the requirements of the NCC. As we saw before, uh, the NCC at least requires 30 minutes of structural adequacy, and for load-bearing external columns from those FRL tables, it was actually 120 minutes. So how can we protect the steel members to make sure that the steel temperature doesn't exceed the limiting temperature for much longer? And how do we know that the intermessent product that we're going to use actually achieve this? So the NCC states that the fire resistance performance of a building element, protected or unprotected, can be determined in any one of these ways. So for example, we can conduct a test on a protected member or a building element, and then a test report can be obtained from an accredited testing lab like Warrant and Fire, and then that test report can be used for direct compliance. But if a certain size of a beam with a given protection, or uh, given thickness of fire protection is tested, then only that certain size of the beam with that given thickness can be assigned an FRL. We are not certainly able to extrapolate to understand how the fire performance varies with different thicknesses. So the most viable option for intermessent products is to go with item D, which is that the protected member is designed in accordance with AS4100 for the required FRL. And in AS4100, we should be looking at section 12, which is um, used for the fire design. So now we can talk about protected members. Clause 12.6 of AS4100 um, gives us guidance on how to determine the fire, res fire resistant performance of protected members. And AS4100 states that the time taken to reach a limiting temperature can be calculated based on either a single test or a series of tests, and all of them have to be conducted in accordance with AS1530 Part 4. Or, um, as an alternative approach, Amendment 1 to this standard states that an assessment report prepared based on an EN standard, EN 13381 Part 4, or Part 8 for reactive coatings like intermessent products, so an assessment report prepared based on these EN standards will also, can also be used for direct compliance without going through any Australian standards. So if a product manufacturer has an EN assessment report, that can be used for direct compliance in accordance with the NCC. So uh, let's take a look at the AS4100 method. So a single test method is very similar to the scenario that I described earlier, which is uh, one certain size of beam, given protection thickness, very limited in its application. So the most widely used method is to go with a, um, a series of tests. And these uh, results from these tests are fed into a regression analysis or a regression model. A best fit line is drawn, an equation is derived, and that equation can be used to interpolate between any steel temperature, any fire protection material thickness, and any section factor. So I'll explain a bit further. Uh, so this is the regression analysis equation from AS4100. If we look at the variables and the coefficients, you'll see that this equation is influenced by the steel temperature, the intermessent coating thickness, and the exposed surface area to mass ratio, which is calculated from the section factor. So if we are able to come up with this equation based on some tested data points, then we can rearrange this equation and find out the exact fire protection material thickness needed or intermessent coating thickness needed for any section factor and for any limiting steel temperature. So this model applies within some conditions. One of these requirements is that a minimum of nine specimens must be tested as a part of the series of tests. And there are two reasons for this. Number one, we need results from at least nine specimens for an accurate best fit line. And number two, we need at least nine tested data points to draw what is known as the window of applicability as shown there. 
So this is the window within which the regression equation can be used to interpolate. We are not able to really go beyond these limits because outside of these boundaries, we don't have any test evidence to back our, con our conclusions. This clause also states that the nine specimens can be tested unloaded as long as stickability has been proved or demonstrated separately. So stickability is the ability of the intermesome product to remain or stay in place when a member is loaded and then subjected to a fire test. When uh, a beam bends, the bottom flange is in tension, the top flange, flange is in compression, and then if it's a column, then it's axial contractions that are the main issue. But under, when it's loaded, there is a real possibility for the intermesome products to peel off or unstick, or sometimes in columns they, they could slump off, and it, they could expose the um, steel directly to the fire. So these loaded tests verify that the intermesome product can stay in place for the required period of structural adequacy. AS 1530 part four says the um, unloaded sections, when they're being tested, they should be at least one meter in length. And AS 1530 part four also gives us the number and location of thermal couples needed to measure critical temperatures in the steel for different cross-section types. And for load-bearing elements, displacements and displacement rates are monitored and compared with defined limits in AS 1530 part four, which are given here for beams and columns. So structural adequacy failure is either at collapse or when one of these limits have been exceeded. Alternatively, um, Manufacturers may have tested all of the required specimens, but in a country where EN or British standards are used for, for testing. In these cases, as part of the accredited testing lab, the assessments team at Warrant and Fire, myself included, we've undertaken this work where we can provide assessments determining the applicability of EN or British standard test data to AS 1530 part four. So we compare and we look at temperature and pressure conditions loading criteria, failure criteria, and thermocouple locations. And we determined that if those test specimens that were tested according to EN or BS data, uh, test methods, if they were tested in accordance with AS 1530 part four, we would get the same results. And once that's established, then we can use that, those same test results for AS 4100 regression models. So one question that uh, we get often asked often is, uh, what is the optimum testing that can be carried out for the most value? And that's a fair question because furnace tests are very expensive, especially loaded tests. So some things to consider are that the maximum PSA will be limited by the maximum PSA achieved by the loaded member, which is used for stickability, to demonstrate stickability. Uh, then the assessed minimum and maximum Intermescent coating thickness will be limited by the tested minimum and maximum coating thickness. So that needs to be included in the test plan. If four-sided exposure is tested, then the results can be applied to the three-sided exposure condition, but stickability has to be proved independently for both conditions. Uh, if, for example, in hollow sections, we have both circular and rectangular. So if, um, in order, instead of testing short sections of both types of cross sections, we can uh, conduct an initial comparative test to see which cross section is more onerous. So this has to be done on loaded members. And once we establish which cross section is more onerous, then all of the short unloaded column sections can be tested with, based on the onerous, more onerous cross section and then the results can be applied for all types. So this table here gives um, some test packages that could be beneficial, but it depends on what needs to be assessed. Is it only beams or only columns or both beams and columns? And if both four-sided and three-sided exposures are needed. But each package will have a loaded section and an unloaded reference beam used to demonstrate stickability and then the required unloaded short sections. So this is the final assessment outcome. So uh, we have results from unloaded short sections. We have results based on the time taken for each of the sections to, to reach specified steel temperatures. And all of that information is fed into the regression analysis model. 
And um, we are able to derive all of these regression coefficients so that we can define what this regression equation is. Once that's done, we can rearrange the equation and find out the exact fire protection thickness that is required for each section factor and for uh, different limiting steel temperatures. The value of this table is that if for a project on site, we have a member and we know its section factor, and the structural engineer has sort of defined a limiting temperature that the steel can be allowed to reach, or it has the steel temperature has to stay below of, then we can just use this table and the intermescent coating thickness can just be directly picked off of this table. So for example, uh, based on the example that I was discussing earlier, for a column with a section factor of 165, we saw that in, it reached 550 degrees in about 15 minutes. But this table shows that a section with a section factor of 165 will reach 550 degrees if it is protected by 3.74 millimeters of this particular inter intermessent product, then it'll actually reach a PSA of 120 minutes instead. So this is just an example here. Uh, so I did talk about alternative EN methods, uh, but I wouldn't really go into this too much. Uh, but it, yeah, the amendment one to AS4100 does say that um, alternative EN assessment methods can be used. In AS4100, there's only one method, just regression analysis. But in EN13381 part eight for intermessent products, uh, Annex E gives us four methods. So any one of these methods can be used. And if an assessment report is produced based on any one of these methods, it would be directly compliant with the NCC. So this is a summary of the compliance pathway. The blocks in orange are the final documents of evidence of suitability that can be presented for compliance with the NCC. So it could be a direct AS 1530 part four test evidence. It could be an AS 4100 regression analysis assessment, or it could be an alternative EN assessment report. So, so far I've been talking about test reports and assessment reports, which are sufficient as evidence of suitability. One further step that can be taken is certification. So we have a certification scheme at Warrant and Fire, it's known as Certifier. Certification involves sampling and testing, factory audits, surveillance audits, and uh, finally producing and registering a certificate. Certification of a product really sets it apart in the market. It uh, gives an assurance about traceability of the product and the manufacturing process and makes sure that what's marketed, the marketed product, has the same fire performance and quality as the tested or assessed product. So that brings me to the end of the AS4100 and NCC method. I hope this was beneficial to you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Engineers Australia and Dulux for providing this platform to me. And if you have any questions about the contents of the presentation or any of the services that we offer, please feel free to contact us by email or give us a call. Thank you. Great work, Suki. That was an excellent presentation. Well, I'd now like to welcome our third speaker for tonight, Roger Tobler. Roger is a technical sales and project management specialist with 11 years in the intermessent industry across South Africa and Australia. During his time with Dulux Protective Coatings, Roger has applied his project management and technical customer service skills as a technical sales representative in Newcastle and is currently the business development manager for Intermescent for Dulux Protective Coatings. Please welcome Roger. Thanks to Suki and to Christian. And so we, I'm going to talk about uh, on site and off site application of Intermescent Coatings. And we've had uh, Christian give us a little talk about uh, intermessent coatings and failure and the use of coatings and the, the talk uh, from Suki on AS4100. So when we're looking at intermessent coatings, there's different types of products for different areas. So um, when we look at uh, protective coatings or, and uh, other types of coatings, decorative and architectural coatings applied on site, we often find these two scenarios where we put them on. We either put them on in yards, and that's mostly protective coatings, which are abrasive blast cleaned, 
or we're working on site where we've got a lower surface level of prep. There we go. All right. So in the overview, you can see we've got off-site construction. We're going to talk a little bit about paint yard and construction sites. Intermessent coatings applied on a construction site and intermessent coatings applied in a yard. So when I started prepping for this, I, I googled off-site construction and this was purely coincidence. The quick search brought up off-site construction and we, we found an engineer's Australia presentation on analysing the benefits of off-site construction. And the punchline on this opening screen was fewer safety incidents per project. And uh, safety is at the forefront for everyone these days and I just thought this was really appropriate that this is a major benefit if we were able to take some of the intermessent work back into the workshop. A little bit more reading on, on off-site construction and I came across modular constructions and the numerous benefits of bringing work to site completed. Speed of construction, improved efficiencies, quality of workmanship when people are working in regular workplaces, improved working conditions, reduced environmental noise, lower emissions on site. And I'm talking general construction, general coatings, it's not aimed at intermessence there. So our building blocks are pre-coded before we play with them. So I put a table together of comparing coatings that are applied in the yard and coatings that are applied on a construction site. And this is just a summary of some of them that quickly came to mind. Often you'll find single component products are applied on site. You can have lower levels of surface preparation working on site. A lot of sites are unable to abrasive blast clean steel, and that's a standard that we go look in Australian standards, AS2312. Uh, when we look at site coatings, a lot of brush and roller applicators, lower productivity, fewer square meters applied per person, increased labor costs. You need a lot of access equipment, and that's really aimed at site site applied. If you look at factory applied, often protective coatings are two component products. They need abrasive blast clean steel. With the equipment in a yard, you can achieve high DFTs, high productivity. You've got constant costs and you've got a controlled environment. Good ergonomics for staff. And that's just looking at coatings. We haven't begun to look at intermessence. So the next screen is uh, intermessent coatings applied on a construction site. Steel needs to be abrasive, blast cleaned and primed before going to site. So now you're starting to divide up the responsibility. Someone's going to do some of the job in a yard and the remaining work's going to be done on site. And one thing that we found helps control this when there's a split responsibility is a project specification. So there's clear, clear explanations on what the standards are, what the coating thickness are, and you've got different fabricators and painters working to one specification, so that does help. Painting, unfortunately, on site is going to move at the rate of construction of the building, or when the building's finished, then the painters will move in. Other trades on site, access to heights needs to be planned, weather conditions affect sites. So these are all challenges for intermessent coatings, which in the past predominantly were single component products, water-based and solvent-based. So now I want to talk a little bit about intermessent coatings applied on a yard. And this is uh, a few steel items that were yard applied and sent to site finish coated. So intermessent coatings in the past, a lot of water-based, a lot of solvent-based products available, and they still applied on site. Recently there's been a move to more durable, faster curing products that dry really fast. Moving the having the coatings applied in yards that are more durable and, and one of the reasons they can be applied in, in yards is because they're more durable They're not going to be subject to transport damage and this general trend will continue Application of durable coating systems is also being made possible because they're all supplied by one supplier So for one supplier applying their products in a controlled environment, there's improved results in efficiency reduced costs Quality is controllable, there's left safety risks. If we go back to quality, if there's any rework done, it's done prior to the steel arriving on site. 
There's fewer contractual complexities in managing different painters, different fabricators, the responsibilities with one applicator and one supplier. So if you're going to work in a yard, one of the challenges is people don't want bottlenecks in a manufacturing facility. So reducing the number of coats in a coating system helps. By putting a durable coating on, you can take out primers. When you take out the primer, you save time, you reduce costs. Coatings can be applied in a yard at really high thickness, measured in millimetres, no longer microns. And that's possible because of the type of equipment and the environment. Durability without a top coat or with only a single top coat is now possible. One intermittent product is part of a system and it can go through all corrosion categories from C1 to C5. You don't have to have different products for different purposes. The, the image at the bottom, there's just a, a, a test panel that underwent, uh, call it 83 days or 2,000 hours of severe cyclic exposure to test it. The results are quite outstanding. I've put a, a gauge in there just to show you how wet film uh, coatings are measured when they're wet. We use a wet film comb. If you're doing this with your feet planted firmly on the ground, not from scaffold, not from a cherry picker, it's far easier to control thicknesses. Curing times. So we're talking about yard applicator. A yard production facility can't come to a standstill. So the time to recoat the product with itself or to put a top coat on is really important. The time to handle steel in a yard. Low temperature curing becomes important. If you leave steel overnight in a paint yard, will it be dry the following morning so you can continue, continue working or move it around? Curing time has an impact on a yard's efficiency. Then we look at durability of yard applied intermittent. This is a product that was applied. A few days later, it was put on a truck, sent to site. You'll find that durable intermittence can now be lifted with chains, slings. There's no damages. Fast drying ensures durable, quick turnaround. Steel can be loaded for transport. Uh, durable for exposure to elements. Most steel doesn't get covered up and the building's not enclosed straight away. And a lot of coatings get damaged in the time that it takes to enclose a, a building. I've mentioned before, durable products can be used both internally and externally, and it's a simplification of specifications and of the supply chain. Ease of application. There's a lot of intermittent coatings available now that are durable, and they can be allied, applied with fairly simple application equipment. Often we talk about either single leg or plural pump equipment, and this just refers to uh, the complexity of the, the product. If parts A and B can be mixed together and put through a single leg equipment or if they need to be pumped separately. So using a single leg equipment allows for low equipment cost and ease of use. Some more durable products do require a plural pump, however. When you go to look at durable intermittent products, their products, some of them require pre-eating, some of them can be spray applied at ambient temperature. You get products that have, require mesh. Uh, Suki spoke about different section sizes, often hollow sections are very challenging for intermittent coatings, and some of the products require mesh to keep them together for the, for the fire testing. Christian mentioned one point in his presentation when we first started, and he spoke about visible exposed steel. And this is one of the main purposes people choose intermessent coatings as opposed to other fire protection methods. And they can really finish well without the use of thinners. And looking at a lot of durable products out there, there's a few that are 100% volume solids, and they now no longer contain any solvents. So there's no more VOCs in the products, or virtually none. That's just an image of a, a pump that you, could, you would require to put a, a durable intermessent coating on with. Sustainability in the future. I mentioned low VOCs, solvent-free epoxies, which are now really durable. They virtually em eliminated solvents. There's no VOCs. The other type of intermessent you see no VOCs in is water-based, and they're typically used on site. They're not as durable. You can reduce VOCs by working in a yard. 
you require far less cleaning, you get more leaders sprayed, less cleaning out because of your better productivity. So can we construct with pre-coded materials? We do it with our children's toys. There's no reason with modern durable intermessent coatings that we no longer have to work on site. We can now move our work back to yards. Thanks, Roger. And now we've got Christian online. So welcome, Christian, from London. Uh, and now it's the time where you, the audience, get involved. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. And we've got Kelly there with the mic. So we do have to have a mic tonight to ask all the questions into that because we are recording tonight's presentation. So does anyone have a question? Awesome. Don't forget to um, just let us know your name and who the question's directed to. Good evening, Roger. Uh, my name is Thomas. I've got two questions for you. So in terms of the durability you're talking about, I just wonder, do you have some kind of numbers like loadings and temperature limits for uh, the products? So I'm dealing with the oil gas industry, and um, so we possibly have some our requirement for you know high pressure pipings and the process piping as well. So can you please give me an answer? Thank you. So the first uh, answer is you get intermittent coatings for hydrocarbon fires and for cellulosic fires. There are products for both aspects, and if you look for a hydrocarbon product, you, you, all of them are epoxy intermittents tested to a different standard, a different fire curve to what was discussed by Sugi earlier. Dulux do not supply any of those, but there are products on the market for oil and gas. So I wouldn't be able to give you specifics of, of loadings. And then when you mentioned your next part of your question, you spoke about durability and thicknesses of coatings. So the thickness relates to the thermal efficiency of it of the paint, so you, how much insulation you're going to get out of it to keep your steel at its limiting temperature. The durability is going to be more linked to the resin type that the, the intermessence works with. So if you look at an epoxy intermessent, you'll get much higher durability. The DFTs start at 400 microns for epoxy intermessence. So at 400 microns, you've, plus your primer, plus your top coat, you've got 500 microns of protective coating on there. So you, you'll get outstanding durability with an epoxy intermittent to corrosion environment. And as you need more and more fire protection, that thickness is going to go up. So with an epoxy intermittent, corrosion protection almost is not an, is taken for granted. When you look at other types of intermittent, water-based or solvent-based product, they far more porous and moisture can damage the coatings. So your corrosion protection is actually really your top coat protecting your intermessent. Once the intermessent is damaged by water, you've only left with your primer as corrosion protection. I don't know if that answers your question, Thomas. I think we're going to another question. <laughs> Some comments. <laughs> Say like here. Um, no, most of the times, you know, when the temperature is going up, so we got to, you know. Uh, loadings limits going down. So it's, it is true for most of the uh, materials, uh, especially for piping industries. But just wonder, if you apply too many, will that cause uh, fracture issues once the temperature is going up? Say, for example, sometimes we get you know, 400, 500, or even 600 degrees. Uh, so that's one of the comments I would ask. And also, do you have some kind of specification sheet that I can find from your website or any other sources? Thank you. Specifications will do on a project basis. So because every single steel science, as Suki raised there, she used an example of HB over AF165. That's one steel element. So every steel element is going to have a different HB over A value and therefore different coating thickness. So we'll turn that HB over A into actual steel sizes and provide a detailed specification. So we'll deal with it on a project-by-project project basis, but I'm only working in the cellulosic and the building environment. 
That's why products are aimed at. And then you asked about fracture or coating thickness. I think Suki answered that one. There's a maximum where stickability becomes an issue or the moment the fire test is failed, the thermocouple exceeds a certain temperature or the coating slumps, hollow columns that can slide down, uh, a beam, the smooth underside, the coating can detach. If that happens, the fire test is stopped and there will be a maximum on those loading tables and you cannot exceed that maximum coating thickness. You should not exceed that maximum coating thickness. Can I just also add, so the outcome tables that I showed would probably be something like the specifications that you have. So um, like Roger said, the section factors can be picked from that. So we, uh, the, the tested maximum thickness that proved stickability, we know for a fact that it's going to remain in place. There are not going to be any fractures or anything like that. So um, our outcome tables would be limited to that and, um, and those would form the specifications. Thanks, Suki. We've got another question from the floor. This one for Suki or Christian. Um, obviously, when you're doing the HP overlay with the section factors, uh, if you've got things like hollow sections where you're filling those with concrete or doing an alt rig and kind of messing around with it, do the, does the HP overlay still stand up? Um, so for uh, composite structures, we have to actually follow a different path. Uh, so we have to go through AS2327, and um, and in that they recommend we can also go through 13381 E and 13381 part um, part six. So uh, that would be a different. Uh, completely different test and assessment um, sort of pathway as well. So that um, we can define in terms of HP um, HP of a, the um, section factor as well. But the performance is going to be different because of the infill concrete. So the, the concrete itself is going to provide some additional fire performance to it. So that needs to be taken into account as well. Um, and um, again, test uh, a test methodology has to be followed. There should be the minimum and maximum thicknesses that need to be tested, stickability proved, and then um, sort of like an outcome table similar to what I showed before can be produced. Christian, did you want to add to that answer? Yeah, to be honest, I, I agree with, with what Suki just said. I don't, uh, uh, essentially, when, when you're dealing with uh, concrete steel, steel tubes, uh, you basically change the the conditions of the of, of what the instrument is experiencing uh, and and the concrete in a certain way acts as a heat sink uh, which as you might imagine changes the the, the thermal conditions of, of what's taking place and, and i think that goes back to what roger was saying before as well uh, it's not straightforward to assume that an intubescent using a certain application for in certain conditions will perform equivalent and when changing cross-section or uh, in this case, which is much more fundamental, which is uh, the going from bare steel to a, to a composite material. And of course, the problems increase when you're dealing with timber and, and, and bare concrete as well. Thanks, Christian. Do we have any other questions from the floor? We do. Um, this is for Suki or Christian. Um, so with that that outcome table that you showed, the precision is about tens or hundreds of of millimeters. That's very precise. So what are the main sources of uncertainty? when you're actually conducting tests, only nine tests, to get to that level of precision and be confident that that actually will give you the performance that you're expecting? Um, so that's the minimum uh, thickness that needs to be applied. And um, in terms of precision, it's coming from the regression equation. And we actually, uh, when we input the results of the time taken for each of the section factors to achieve limiting temperatures, we can actually use that precision based on the raw test data. And um, and that would, um, if, if uh, so if that is, for example, 3.74 to three decimal points is the minimum, then that can be rounded off. 
within the um, tape points um, or interpolating between as well. So if other thicknesses are needed, then um, different, um, if there's a different section factor or if other thicknesses are needed, then between minimums and maximums that can be interpolated as well. Thank you. Christian, did you want to jump in on no, that one no, as well? No, 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 nothing to add really, yeah. That's the, the, the interpolation. It's something that is uh, well awesome. demonstrated. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, we've, got, we've got heaps of questions coming through. <laughs> Hi, I've got a short like design question. Uh, my name is Vincent. I'm from Omni. Um, so, in regards to using selecting um, intermittent paint as a solution for fire uh, protecting steel structures. In the school, right, where we can expect the kids to be tagging everything and you know, that, that people will be scraping things off whenever they're, they're like having nothing to do, would you recommend something? Um, would you recommend like um, intermittent paint on those sort of conditions? And like, um, would um, the intermittent paint react with different types of paints and to like uh, undermine its like performance in fire? Thank you. I think that's my question. <laughs> um, so we've got two different intermittent coatings we supply, and I'll just call them generic. So the first one is a, an epoxy, and uh, we recently had a, someone put some coating on where they weren't supposed to put it. So they painted a three-sided beam that's as a four-sided beam, so the whole top flange was not supposed to be coated. They had to take a jackhammer to get it off. They couldn't get it off, and after they had to grind the surface. So the epoxy coatings are extremely durable. Uh, more durable than anything else you're probably going to find in a school. Uh, and then they are top coated for color. So if you if you were going to top coat it, uh, you do have to stick to a, a approved top coat because the top coats we put through a furnace, and we check that they don't influence they don't influence the intermittent that it does it is able to swell up underneath. So we'll limit the choice of top coat. You can't just put anything on. You can put anything on, but it might not work. So we'll we'll give you a list in our specifications of four or five different options. Uh, a water-based intermittent is going to be a whole lot softer, or a solvent-based single pack will be somewhere between the two. But we, we would put a polyurethane over that, and the polyurethane is a pretty durable coating. Next time we had another question. Uh, yes, uh, Roger. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of if you've done a, a workshop application, you take your steel to site and then you need to do field touch-ups, is there any risk of localised failure, you know, when, it, when it's in a fire, is there any risk of localised failure then um, causing a broader failure of your coating? So the, the, the biggest risk for failure is surface preparation. So provided they've sanded and cleaned, the touch-ups are fairly easy with some of the products. These touch-up kits, or they can be brush roller troweled. So it comes down to the applicator and the, the surface prep is probably, like I said, the most important thing to, to any coating, not just intermittent coating. We've got another question. Sorry, Roger, just the... Um... Sorry, it's got a question there following the last ones. Say, for example, on site, uh, if the steel structure is being galvanized, I just wonder, is that paint galvanized uh, friendly? Thank you. Before I answer that one, is anyone here from the Galvanizing Association? So don't, <laughs> offend, uh, don't offend anybody. Second thing I need to say is I'm South African, so we don't feel too much about offending people either. <laughs> Um, so, w with galvanizing, the best surface prep you can do to put a coating on it is to brush blast it. Now you send galvanized steel to site and you want to brush blast on site. So again, the two don't work together that well, so you want to do that in a yard. When, when, when you brush blast, you clean and you create a small profile and then you'll get the coating to stick to it. We found with the, I put up a panel there and we did 2,000 hours on, on the epoxy in a in accelerated uh, uh, sole spray cabinet, and the results were outstanding. And we've recently, I won't put the numbers there, but we've provided some guarantees on the product with just a primer or without a primer for internal use. And we believe you'll get to 
the A's 23 112 maximum life expectancy is 25 years, you'll get to that with this NMS and cutting without the galvanizing. So is the galvanizing needed to, for the corrosion protection of this product? No, it's not. If you want to galvanize it, we'll, we'll recommend a surface prep that's best suited to galvanizing. And then we'll recommend a tie coat, and then you can put on the product. So yes, you can galvanize. But if you're going to galvanize, you're going to blast, how much, what costs are you going to? If you can eliminate the galvanizing and still get the corrosion protection, it may cost you less. Thanks, Roger. Are there any other? Oh, we've got another question. Um, Andrew here from Red Fire Engineers. Um, I've got two questions for Roger. Um, when you have uh, wall framing hard fixed to uh, protect the steel, what do we do with it? Because um, intermittent paint works on swelling. And also, when you have um, protected and unprotected connection, um, what do you do to treat um, at the connection? I'll agree with Christian here. Your first preference is not to is to have free space for expansion of the intermescent. And a lot of people always ask about cladding. You, you want to have enough free expansion. That's the first choice. And if you look at every single intermescent applicator, Applicate, uh, supplier, they'll recommend the same thing. There are some alternatives and, and comments that they do make relating to cladding burning away. So intermessents typically expand plus minus. And Christian might, uh, working in a lab, he, he, might, he might reprimand me afterwards. Plus minus 200 degrees is where intermessents expand. I'm, I'm not a cladding supplier, but I think cladding burns off before 200. But that's not for me to say when the cladding is going to burn off. Ask the cladding supplier. Uh, so. It's likely it'll burn off, but I, we would always recommend leave the free, if you can, leave the space. If you can't leave the space and there's uncertainty, there's other methods of fire protection. There's boards, there's vermiculite. We don't want everything. If it's not going to be safe, don't use it. Look to something else. I've got a hand at the back there which, who wants to throw in some help. He's sending me a lifeline. It's one of my deluxe colleagues. So, what's the, what's what? the minimum? <laughs> What's the minimum gap, Roger, from uh, so spacing that's needed if you're going to have a cladding or something like that in between the intermescent? Every coating expands differently. So I can tell you what our average expansion is. It's not measured in, and Suki will tell you they don't measure expansion space. They've, they've got thermocouples, they measure temperatures, but a single pack intermescent water based, solvent based products expand about 50 times. Our epoxy expands about 30 times. And that's 30 times the applied DFT. So every steel item is going to be bigger. So if you haven't got space, use heavier steel so you can use less coating. And you might get away with the space. But so every case is, look at it. And then you ask me a question on bolted connections or, or unprotected members. So there's a really useful guide, and it's, it's not Australian. It's, it's the source document is somewhere in the UK called the Association of Fire Protection. And they give some really good advice on a whole lot of different fire protection topics. And they speak about unprotected members in a coat back. In a coat back, they work on 500 millimeters. The protected item work back 500 millimeters in length on the unprotected item and protect that item too. And then you and that will allow for the heat transfer through a, through a connection. Well, we've got another question at the back. We are starting to run out of time, so yeah, this is and this is for the Roger. Uh, I have very different question because this topic is always in the steel, but I have not the steel questions. I have like the XLPE, the cable, the high voltage power cable, because once we purchase the power cable, this is not the fire resistance. Okay, so once we don't have the fire resistance cable, is there any coating in Deluxe can paint a coating to make the fire resistance? Quick answer is no. So. The problem with a cable is uh, cables are often new cables are clean, but old cables are usually filthy, and you want to put a cutting over something that's dirty. And cables are flexible, so epoxy is not going to work. You're going to need to have a mastic. So, and there are products on the market. Deluxe don't have one that they need to be flexible, so you're not going to use a liquid coating that's designed for steel because it doesn't flex and bend. You need to find a mastic intermescent, and there are some products on the market, but we don't have any. Okay, thank you. And we've got one more question, Kelly, in front of you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Stavros. Um, I've got 
Uh, two quick questions for uh, Roger. Uh, um, I think maybe uh, Suki will be able to answer as well. I think, Roger, you touched on the top code. Uh, I'm wondering uh, when you are going to produce a certificate for, for an intermission product, uh, do you test it with a top code, uh, without top code? Uh, and when you said that you tested the top code and it doesn't affect the behavior of the intermission, uh, when you're looking at just the swelling or uh, how the we're looking at the substrate as well, so whether the steel, uh, the, the temperature that it um, gets from from your from the curve is different. Uh, that's the first question. The the top code testing we do is to the ISO 834 curve. I just check the numbers; they're not all in my head. So they they will will take two reference panels. Panels are I think. I think they're a meter by a meter, but they're fairly large panels. It's thermocouples on the back, and they, there's a reference panel without a top coat. There's a panel with a top coat on, mm -hmm. and they measure the time to reach 500 degrees Celsius. Now, this isn't done by a third party, so the top coat compatibility is done by Manifest. intermittent suppliers. So we, all our top coats that we recommend that we've tested, we've uh, it's gone through a furnace. The time to 500 is monitored, the difference between uncoated and coated panels, and there's a, a variance that's acceptable. I think it's 85%. It needs to, to any, all the top coats, uh, it's quite tricky to get a panel exactly at 1,000 microns. So there's a, sometimes there's slight differences in coating thicknesses when you spray apply a product, and there's an allowance made for that. So they do monitor, we do check that as a as an actual measure test. And the second thing that gets done is a visual comparison mm. to to do a, a, a check that the coating has expanded. So that's done of the top coat. So that's why we just won't say yes to any other top coat because it doesn't happen in five minutes. It needs to be prepped, sent to a furnace. Um, and you had a second part to the question. Did I answer everything? Yeah, yeah you did. I, I mean, I was interested whether you're looking at the swelling or the limiting temperature, but you did both, I guess. So, so that's on a test panel to that we're comfortable with, but the tests done by labs are intermittent only. They, 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 only they, they, so the, the loading tables and the, and the data that Suki prepared would be only globally, every, the standard is the same for everyone. Every intermittent company would test like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. So the um, outcome tables and the regression equation is all prepared using DFT only, which is dry film thickness. Yeah. And you will normally give them a range of DFTs that you've, you've tested your top coat on? Correct. So right. on our specification, we'll put in the DFT of the top coat. And that's another reason for limiting the, no the range of top coats is some of the top coats can go at higher DFT. So we, yeah. we don't specify. You'll see most of them are polyurethanes or, or alkyds enamels. There's, there's no epoxies. Uh, they, they're too strong and uh, they go on too thick. So, those, so that will come through in all of our specifications. Right. Uh, the, the second part is, um, how often do you actually carry out maintenance for internal applications uh, uh, you, um, of, of, a, of, a, of an intermessin? So you put intermessin in, a, in an office building. Um, um, how often do you need to come and reapply that coating? So if the coating's undamaged, you don't yes. have to come and reapply. So, so, so it has a service life of... The, the the biggest issue is the top coats, right? And the top, especially if you're using a a solvent based or water based, it's the epoxy is less susceptible to damage. So if the top coat's compromised on a water based or solvent based product, you could get moisture ingress. And so if you've got no, if you do a visual inspection, you've got no top coat damage, then there's very little chance it's damaged the coating, provided you're using a coating that's specified for the correct environment. Okay, if, you, so, if you're using a water-based on the on a sea frontage and a C5 environment, so okay. use the correct specification, and if the top coat's not damaged, the coating should be good for the design life. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, I think is that all for questions? Because I think that's about time for our Q&A tonight. So um, please join me in thanking our speakers, Dr. Christian Malouk, who's dialed in from London, uh, Suki Sendanaka and Roger Tobler for their time and insights tonight. I would also like to thank again Engineers Australia's industry partner, Dulux Protective Coatings, for their support.
Now, look, thank you again for joining us tonight. It's great to actually have people back in the room, um, but please join us for some refreshments. Our speakers will, uh, will join us, obviously, and we'll see you all at our next Thought Leaders event. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.